Hi, my name is Jared Baker with Long Hunters, and uh, today we're finally going to make good on uh, a promise we've made to a lot of you over the last several weeks that to make a video on broken bolt tabs and what to do about it and how to pull the bolt out of a 73 rifle. And I'm sorry this video has been so long coming. It was we've been incredibly busy, and it was hard for me to sit down and make a video when I should have been working on your rifles or uh, handguns or whatever other firearm the case may be. So I appreciate everyone's patience on this, but we're finally getting around to doing it. And it's been a long time coming. Uh, it's broken bolt tabs. And it's a really common problem nowadays. 10 years ago, it was not non-existent, but it was somewhat rare. And even I can remember as short as five or six years ago, not seem to be the issue that it is now. It can be caused potentially um, I suppose by improper tuning of the rifle. We have found, even in the worst cases though, that to be quite rare. And there's a lot of myths floating around about what breaks a bolt tab and how you fix it. Um, the most common solution everyone does is replace the bolt. We do not recommend that. And I'll say that again. We do not recommend replacing the bolt when you break your bolt tab. It will cause a host of other problems it's a cure to the symptom, but not the disease. And in fact, mo as most of you notice, you break one, then you'll break the next one because what broke that bolt tab is still in there. So, uh, or might still be being imposed on the rifle's action. So if you replace the bolt tab, for one thing, I can virtually guarantee you it will happen again, or if you rather just replace the bolt, I can virtually guarantee you that it will happen again. And secondly, it causes usually a host of other problems. The biggest one, stemming from headspace. Your headspace will be off. The odds of it being R are probably somewhere around 1 in 10. Um, bolt to bolt, we'll see as much as 15 thousandths difference uh, in 173 to the next. Each of these bolts, while we're in the day and age of CNC, and to be honest, some of these 73 rifles are made better than any of the American manufacturers make any firearm. These are CNC bolts, but how they go into the rifle is selected, actually used to be a process of hand fitting. So if your rifle's much more than about seven years old, each of these bolts were hand fitted into it. There's a lot of people in cowboy action shooting rifles that are that old. So for you especially, it's usually the, the, the detriment of replacing the bolt is noticed much quicker. On any of the newer rifles, you birdie uses the same process we do now to set, change, or reset the headspace, and that is links. They have custom links made, manufactured in different links. Lengths, that way when a bolt's put into the rifle and the headspace is off 10 thousandths, it's simply a matter of getting a set of links machined that will take up the slack out of 10 thousandths. And it's a pretty good system but it also makes it somewhat confusing sometimes for people that don't know that's the way headspace is set in the linkage system of 73. So now that you understand that, while you may be able to get away for a little while with replacing the bolt, and uh, trust me, I hope you get away with it as long as you can, you need to have the bolt repaired. Don't throw away the original. I understand in a match, you know, it's really nice to have a spare one and throw it in and hopefully it'll get you through the match, but don't throw this thing away, get it repaired. There, we've had two or three customers over the last several years who have rifles who have a really bad habit of breaking a lot of bolts. I just want to put everyone's, uh, make everyone aware that this is not a rule and there are at least two occasions I can think of, two very good customers of ours who had rifles who legitimately had a problem at this. But what we need everyone to understand is that broken bolt tabs are more shooter induced than anything at all. And I would say in this year alone, any of the broken bolt tabs we fixed, the causes for why they broke in the first place were caused by what we call a shooter short stroke. Not a short stroke rifle, but a shooter short stroke. Um, and we had two occasions this year, uh, which you know is, is small in comparison to many of these as we fixed where it was actually a cause of the lifter spring being too weak, any of the lifter lever springs operating too weak. So um, whether it created carrier balance or they simply weren't strong enough to elevate the carrier, we're gonna show y'all what makes them break and how you 
would pull the bolt out of the rifle and hopefully how you can help prevent it. A shooter short stroke is the most common cause of uh, broken bolt tabs breaking. Um, what we're going to do is basically emphasize the importance it is to take the lever. If you'll notice in any 1873, there's a dead zone here in the lever when, in which after opening it seems like the lever is doing absolutely nothing. What that space is for is when the lever reaches this point, now you're sitting on the carrier spring. This is the carrier. You can see the carrier starting to move. At this point, this should very positively pop your carrier up. Um, no, requires not, not, not any great deal of effort at all, but it should be a positive pop. Okay, And it's possible to take this lever not all the way to the bottom, but to stop it, say, a sixteenth of an inch, a thirty-second, any amount hurts, short of actually hitting the bottom before you return the lever to the closed position. So it's, it's caused by not necessarily running too fast, but a failure to hit the bottom, and sometimes it's referred to by outrunning the rifle. Um, the hammer spring can help prevent this from happening. We'll show you that. But one of the best things you can do in practice so that it doesn't happen to you in a match is to concentrate and to do drills that will reinforce in your muscle memory a positive connection of every time you operate that lever to actually strike the bottom of the stroke. Don't spend any time down there, but by all means, make absolutely sure that the rifle goes all the way to the bottom. That will prevent 9 out of the 10 broken bolt tabs that happen. It takes one short stroke to break a bolt tab if things line up correctly. That's all it takes, so it doesn't, it, I don't, it doesn't matter if you do it sometimes or very rarely. It takes one time to, do, to break that tab. One of the common uh, myths, if you could call it that, that we deal with is that if you make the bolt tab strong enough, it won't break. That is not true. When you super short stroke, and so this would be like a Gen 4 or later super short stroke kit, which is what this would have in it. This is a Pioneer super short stroke. You're reversing leverage when you put a short stroke kit into a rifle, and so the you're moving the lever less and accomplishing more in a shorter amount of time. So the bolt in this thing, when you close that lever, even just that fast, that bolt is coming home about two and a half times harder than it was from the factory. And the third gen also, uh, you know, it's gonna be even less so. It, it, it has a longer stroke. The bolt's not moving as quickly. So I say that to say, when you throw this thing down home in a super short stroke rifle, on top of the rim of that case, it has to go somewhere. Either the case is going to chip out, which some people have noticed, if you care to go pick up your brass sometimes and actually look at them every now and then they'll come across a head stamp. I uh, had a customer call me in fact one time, he broke his bolt tab, mailed the bolt in for repair, and then said, say, uh, remember you was telling me that on the phone, I actually in my reloading when I, from when I was practicing, I found the head stamp, and there is a big old nick took out of that case. It's not a question of making the bolt tab strong enough. Our repair bolts are approximately, according to a fine gentleman at Roswell who tested them for us, about four, four and a half times harder than the factory. And they'll break like that if they're, if they're hit hard enough. Now, generally speaking, the metal we use to weld them up and recut them now, it tends to bend more than it does break because it's hard, but it's not brittle. And it, while it helps, it's still not going to prevent the problem. And a bent bolt tab in a match is every bit nearly as bad as a broken one because then, as most people have experienced, it tends to try and lock the lever in the open position. So uh, we'll also show you that. Now, to remove the bolt from an 1873 or an 1866, you'll have to remove the buttstock. So there's only two screws that hold the buttstock on, the upper tang screw and the lower tang screw. And sometimes it takes quite a bit of force to remove the wood, so just be ready for that. Go ahead and take out the side plate screw, 
and then on an 1873, before you go any further, loosen the lifter and lever spring screws. This will keep you from stripping out the lever screw. Now you can loosen and remove the lever screw. The lever and the lifter will just pull straight out of the bottom. Now you can take out the lower tang receiver screws, one on each side. Now when you remove the lower tang, they're in really tight. It takes quite a bit of force sometimes to actually get it out. We find that a rocking motion back and forth is the easiest way to do it. And it uh, looks easier in the video sometimes than it actually is. There's a little bit of technique involved with that one. Now when you go to take out the bolt, the bolt is held to the firing pin extension by the forward link pin. Uh, you may be able to push it out with your fingers, but sometimes you will have to use a hammer and a punch, and sometimes you'll have to strike it quite hard in order to remove them. Now the keeper is the little flat piece of metal that actually holds the bolt and the firing pin extension together. Once the link pin's gone, it'll pull straight down and out of the way, and then it'll separate your extension from your bolt. And before you can remove the bolt, you'll have to remove the dust cover screw. Uh, don't take the dust cover off, just take the screw out and slide the dust cover back a quarter of an inch or so and then you can remove the little uh, keeper there and then the bolt will just rock down and out. Now when you go to put it back together, uh, it's obviously just the same as the reverse, but it really helps when you put your firing pin back into the bolt that you uh, Go ahead and set the firing pin, get it all the way down, seat it into the bolt sometimes. And then you can put your uh, extension and your keeper together. When you put the keeper up inside there, just make sure that it does grab the extension. You don't want to get all the way through it and figure out they didn't catch. And then just tap or just push in your forward link pin. Make sure everything's working good. And I apologize ahead of time uh, on the video. Um, I thought I was going somewhat slow at the time, but now that we've actually went back and watched the video, uh, it's I'm going probably a little too fast for what would be ideal for learning purposes. Of course, I am sorry about that, but I really did slow down. Just it doesn't really look slow enough. Now, when you go to tighten the lifter lever spring screws, this is a very important part of the reassembly that most people aren't aware of. Uh, it's important to push on the spring uh, against the lever while you're tightening the screw down. I push on it with my thumb like this and tighten down that screw. Now on the lifter screw, it's the critical one because you've got right hand torsion that is actually trying to pull that spring off of the cam. So you'll want to strike it on the housing or the rearward part of the spring, much like uh, the effect an impact wrench would give it, and it will actually remove that right-handed torsion that's trying to pull that spring off the cam. This will keep your cams from being chunk, ch uh, chewed on by the spring or being worn down halfway. And then every single time you go to put on a... Uh, lifter and lever spring grease that every single time even if it was just a few seconds ago the last thing it needs on there is a bed of grease um, both the lifter and the lever springs need grease on the cams the cams you'll, are something that must always stay wet and don't ever let them dry out uh, because it just takes a few dozen uh, rounds of, of galling for those to wear down completely Now one of the most important things about bolt tabs is the carrier elevation and the lifter spring which elevates the carrier up and down or rather holds it in its uh, full upright position. If that lifter spring, which is why the cams are so important, if that lifter spring is too weak then there is nothing to hold the carrier up at the top or at full elevation and then the bolt tab is, ex is exposed to the rim of the case. It can also bounce off the top if the carrier spring isn't strong enough. So 
while a lot of people really like to have a buttery lifter spring that practically does nothing, it is really not a good deal. And springs in any gun, of course, are very important, and even more so in cowboy action for rapid shooting. It's very important that you have good spring tension to keep things running quickly and uh, fluidly, and it'll really help your gun last a lot longer and keep your bolt tab from breaking. Now the carrier is what we're going to show you next. See here, this carrier's got a trough, and all carriers have them, even the 45 and the large calibers. That trough's job is to protect that bolt tab from the rim of the case. As long as the bolt tab is riding in that trough where it's supposed to be, it cannot hit the case, and we could say that it cannot break. But that round, the cartridge here, is going to ride in the bottom of the carrier all the time. And the bolt, not necessarily, if the carrier is not fully elevated. This round will not have a gap in it like this. It's going to be all the way down because of gravity and even inertia. The round or the rim of the case will always be riding on the bottom of the carrier. So here you can see a bolt and a cartridge in the carrier. Now this light shaded area here underneath the round is that trough and you can see that the bolt is out of the trough but the rim of the case which is the largest part of any of these cartridges is riding in the bottom of the carrier and so the tab on the bottom of the bolt is actually not underneath the rim of that case and it's not in the trough it's actually exposed and directly behind the rim and as the round goes forward it's going to try to ramp up into the barrel it has to and you can see that doesn't help things out because the rim is still riding in the bottom of the carrier, which is not at full elevation. And so rather than going into the extractor, now then that tab is actually directly behind the rim of the case. And as that last quarter of an inch uh, goes into the barrel there, you can see that round, ha that tab has to come under the bottom of that rim. And it basically has two choices, either bend or break. One of the things we found that will help you uh, keep from short stroking your rifle is if you'll run an appropriate hammer tension. Uh, most people in cowboy probably run a hammer tension that's too, that is too light. Um, a light hammer spring will, it, it will lessen the effort required to push the lever forward. But in most cases, in most cases, it probably does more harm than good. Uh, one thing that running a good hammer spring will eliminate is light primer strikes, as we all know. There, today with the uh, firing pin mods and uh, running federal primers, you can run a hammer spring that's so light uh, that you know, you're not going to have a light strike, but sometimes it's good to run a heavier one anyways, if nothing else, to counter your movements or your efforts that you put into the rifle. Um, you know, Jim taught me this actually years ago, and it's something I found to be very true. And in, in shooting, um, a light hammer spring, which I've intentionally set this hammer spring too light, a light hammer spring will uh, increase the energy that your um, lever strikes the bottom at and it will actually hold your rifle more stable if you run a heavier hammer spring it acts just like a suspension in the race car that of course determines on how fast you shoot but the faster you shoot the heavier hammer tension you should run it will help you you'll have to practice maybe to adjust to it but one thing uh, that's important to know is how to adjust the hammer tension on your rifle now there's a lot of aftermarket hammer uh, modifications like hammer springs that are non, that are non-adjustable but so I, I'm primarily speaking to people that are shooting like our rifles all of our rifles come fully adjustable and we do this on purpose it really helps us out with warranty someone getting light strikes it's as simple as telling them to grab a screwdriver and turn a screw uh, but back to broken bolt tabs and how it relates to your hammer spring if your hammer is so light, and I'm going to cock the hammer to simulate this, where I have no resistance other than the lifter spring, which you see operating right here, it's actually possible for me to stop, as I just did there, and short stroke this gun. And it's actually catching that carrier at that point. I've, sh I've stroked it so short. 
In that case, the rifle will jam. If we go on a little further up, the rifle won't jam. And that's part of the virtues of a 73 is even short strokes will actually still run. But as we discussed, now your bolt tab is in grave danger. So if I run a hammer spring, however, that is heavy enough and where uh, I like to, we generally like to set them and this will need to be, you know, shooter to shooter, but based on your string and how you will lever your rifle, I stick the rifle into your hip and slowly lever that gun. And it should be to the point where you cannot physically short stroke. I'm trying to short stroke this gun and I'm going to get this hammer spring right there. At that point, I'm sitting here trying to stop that lever and I can't because that spring is forcing my hand to actually take that lever all the way to the bottom. And plus, when you're actually shooting, it will counter the movements that you put into it. And of course, that's based on your strength. But the faster you're going, your rifle will stay a lot more stable. You can dry fire on a light switch or something, and you'll notice a difference with a little practice by increasing your hammer tension. If nothing else, it increases your lock time. Now, these are some crude numbers here, and I'm making these numbers up. Uh, but for an example, the lock time on an 1873, I estimate uh, when your hammer spring is set correctly to be somewhere around five thousandths of a second. Um, without a doubt, there are many people who are running a hammer spring who, if we could actually hook it up to a timer, would be probably running near a hundredth of a second. Um, and some of them even more. You know, we've all seen those guys who have the hammer spring you can literally watch it fall. If you double your lock time, aside uh, as well as eliminating light strikes and the potential to short stroke your gun, and by the fact that it keeps your guns uh, more stable uh, during levering, much like a suspension, like we talked about, if we can double our lock time that will uh, do some simple math here across uh, 10 shots a stage, let's just say in a 10 stage match, if you gained, and, uh, and this would be obviously an extreme example, but if you gain five thousandths of a second every shot, like I said, that's an extreme example and crude numbers, but five thousandths of a second, that's half of a hundred, or five, that's half of a hundredth multiplied out over a hundred times, that's half a second at the end of the match just off pulling the trigger. And many world championships, as you know, have been won and lost by a hundredth of a second. So it's something to think about. Uh, it never hurts. It, it'll only hurt you to run too light a hammer spring. I'll put it to you that way. You want to run as heavy a hammer spring as you can to where you're not fighting it. And, you know, that's counterintuitive. I'm not saying you should be running a factory spring, but I am saying that your hammer spring should be heavy enough that it correctly counters your movement and your speed and it also eliminates the possibility of you actually outrunning the rifle and having an out battery discharge. Now most people don't believe this and this is another topic for another day but it is very possible and in fact we see it all the time where guys will have a hammer spring that is so light and with modern firing pins and everything that we can put into these they can actually pull the trigger and already begin opening the lever before the hammer actually comes down. And so the links will unlock right here. The bolt doesn't move, but the links have unlocked. And it's just the same thing as having an out of battery. And they'll and their that question always is, I've got a lever safety in mine and I had an out of battery discharge. How does that happen? And you reach up there and their hammer spring goes, Bleh. That's that's how that can happen. But that's another topic for another day. But run a heavy hammer to prevent broken bolt tabs. The biggest thing is to run a heavy enough hammer spring that it won't let you short stroke your gun and um, or have absolutely perfect technique and don't short stroke your gun. I'm not real sure that's possible because uh, we are all are prone to error, but one of those two. The lifter lever springs, if you can imagine, which are right here, make sure that these are not loose. It's a big habit of people to loosen off this lifter spring because they think it makes the rifle smoother. Um, it will eliminate this spring tension right here. For instance, this pop that you see, that's your lifter spring doing its job. If we eliminate that, well, now your carrier has no reason to stay all the way up there. And in fact, especially on, um, and of course this is usually from the 357s and such, but especially on the shorter rounds, the 38 specials, the 
seating a little bit more important that your carrier be all the way up there. The 357s are so long that they'll usually lessen that uh, initial slam when they're entering the chamber. They don't pinch as bad just because it's a much longer round. They tend to level out, lot, level out a lot quicker and stay that way going into the chamber. But um, heavy hammer spring, heavy enough hammer spring, and good lifter lever springs, either factory modified or we like the slicks that Buster uh, makes. Um, Buster Baum and the slick springs, they're perfect, but you got to tighten them down all the way. And contrary to another popular belief, they are not adjustable. They're made to take down all the way, and that's the way we do it on our rifles. Um, just, you know, a tip for you there. Now, when you go to adjust the hammer spring, these two screws here are your hammer adjustment springs. These two screws here are your hammer adjustment screws. Now this is, they both adjust the hammer tension. This is, uh, this is something that also we'd like to uh, uh, share with everybody because this is very often misunderstood. This is actually your primary adjustment screw, not the little one. The little one pushes the hammer spring tight, this one pulls it tight. And anytime you go to adjust your hammer spring or when you pick up a rifle or get it from us, you're going to have to turn the hammer spring up about every eight months. Um, the springs will, leaf springs will relax over time. Well, in fact, coils will too. All spring steel is going to relax. So turn it up uh, about every you know six months to a year and uh, to keep good hammer spring tension. These hammer springs will last four or five years if you do this. So in order to tighten a hammer spring, or to adjust it, back the little screw all the way off. It should be completely loose, have no tension on it whatsoever. Then you will make your adjustments, either loose or tight, on your big spring here. And after that is done, you will take your screwdriver and tighten your little guy back down till it hits, and I'm hitting right there, and then maybe like an eighth of a turn, just to snug it up and get some tension on it. That way it can't fall out, it won't loosen up. The problem is, if you can visualize, if you tighten this little guy first without tightening this one, you've got a gap between this uh, and your the hammer spring and your lower tang, and you put a you bend an S curve into the hammer, it makes the gun feel really weird, and um, also it's hard on your hammer spring. So, if uh, and it, it'll it'll increase your hammer tension or your resistance in your hammer, but you won't get any more energy out of the hammer spring so it's it's really not a good deal so back this one out all the way every time before you tighten it now then i can tighten it even more you know now then let's say two or three years down the road here we are and i've bottomed this screw out okay it's bottomed out now and so once that is actually bottomed out now then you will come up here and begin adjusting this screw okay so that's the way you, you would tighten a hammer spring. Um, you tighten it like that in the last few several years.